Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of The Research Knows. Our interviewee today is Melissa Chawaremera Rozo, who is a program manager for the School of Law at the Independent Institute of Education in South Africa. She lectures courses on tax law and has qualifications that include an LLB, which is a Bachelor of Laws, and a Master of Laws specializing in tax law. Aside from academic work, Melissa is a wife, a mom, and I think she's a runner from what I saw on Instagram as well. And I'm sure there's so much more because this bio is a mere snippet of who she is or what she's going to share with us today. Melissa, welcome. Thank you so much, Prem. I'm, I'm really, really happy to join you for this session. Thank you for having me. Amazing. And how are you doing today? I am fine. It's exam season for our students, so mm. it's a very busy time to say the least, um, very stressful time for them more than it is for us. So just trying to forge through. <laughs> awesome. All the best with everything. Thank you. Great. So our entry question is always to ask participants to kindly share with us, you know, what is your field of study and how did you get to where you are today academically? Um. I hope I don't go on a tangent with giving full context for this. Um, So I will try to summarize as best as possible, but I think I need to add context with a few things. So I studied at the University of Johannesburg. Uh, Initially, what I wanted to study, so this is high school. In high school, I wanted to be in hospitality. I wanted to be an emphasis because I wanted to see the world. Mm-hmm. jokes on me um but you know as I uh progressed with my high school journey I then realized that I had more strains towards the art subject so I was doing a Cambridge curriculum mm-hmm. and with that curriculum I quickly realized that things like history things like English literature divinity um, were more of strong points for me than were accounting and mathematics and science or biology. So yeah. um, with that, then I majored in art subjects. I did pretty well for that. I got, um, so I wrote two examination boards. The one I got 15 points, which was three A's. And then the other examination board, I got 12 points. Uh, one I wrote in June and then the other one I wrote in December. So with those results, I then thought psychology or law. And Mm. I remember a few family friends of ours telling my parents that you can't let her study psychology because, you know, you want a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer in your family. Um, And, you know, because my sister was the first one, I think, in our extended family to go into tertiary, I think my parents felt a bit of pressure to say, you know what, if you could get those results, surely you can pull it off. So uh, fast forward to getting into university, I studied my LLB. Um, My preference would have been to do a BA law first and then an LLB for two years, making it five years, two degrees, big stuff. Mm. Um, But funds were not available for that. And I had... A few relatives who were helping with funding, family, friends helping with funding, but also I'd managed to get a bursary at the University of Johannesburg. So then because of that, I then had to go with the straight LLB route. I quite enjoyed but I think even throughout my studies, I saw myself as this person who's going to be in court with all the dramatics and, you know, objecting and saying all Mm -hmm. these cool things that we all see on TV. So I was very excited for that journey. Mm. And then when I completed my studies, which I think I did fairly well, pretty decently, um, I then got placed into a farm. So we finished, when I finished my studies in the November of my year of completion, the next year by June, I'd found placement for articles with the firm. Mm. Uh, During the course of my studies, I had worked with other law firms. So I had a bit of experience with working with law firms as an intern, as a researcher, etc., So got into the firm, had to go to court every day, had to file documents and sometimes Mm. take things to the sheriff's office and then realized very quickly in that space of time that I hated it. I was not built for practice. (laughs) The courts were not as glamorous as I had hoped they would be or that I thought they would be in terms of what you see on TV. And um, fortunately, during the same time that I had started my articles, I'd already enrolled because... 
prior to getting placement, I had applied to just further my studies. So also still with the University of Johannesburg, I was studying for my uh, master's in tax law. So fortunately with that came a few opportunities to be a part-time lecturer, uh, opportunities to be, well, started off with sen tutor, senior tutor, uh, lecturing assistant, then part-time lecturer. But I think I realized very quickly, I remember my first lecture that was mine where I have developed the material and I'm going to deliver the material. I think I've got all those fun things to talk to students about and mm -hmm. the engagements I want to have with them. I then realized that, you know, in that session, I felt so light. I felt wow. happy. I I really enjoyed it. And I'll be honest, I know it doesn't sound sounds a bit arrogant, but I actually <laughs> felt like I'm really good at this. Ooh. Whereas when I was in the firm and I had to draft legal documents, my principal, my, you know, uh, the, the director at that time always had an issue with a few things that I would do. For example, I would put in footnotes in <laughs> in certain documents, and then he said, "This is not research," you know, oh, ironically. Okay. Like, oh, this is not. This is a court document, or this mm. is a brief for advocates. You don't need to be putting in all this because he'd even ask me, "What's this?" And I'm like, "Those are footnotes." He's like, "Why are you putting them?" I'm like, "No, I'm just trying to, you know, because I don't want to make it too lengthy, but they need to know where I got the information from." So I think it was one of those things where he could see that I don't necessarily fit in there. Mm. Um, so on the research front, doing research for the firm, helping with cases, you know, finding the substantive law that would then be applied to help our clients. I was very good with that. Mm. Client consultation, I was very good with that. Uh, drafting of documents to a certain extent, but I did better with reports uh, you know, at, at some point then we agreed that he'd place me in commercial forensics, mm -hmm. um, which then went pretty well because I think then it was very research-based. I could be an expert witness for commercial forensic issues. Mm -hmm. And we, I think myself and my, my boss at that time quickly realized, okay, this works better. Uh, I remember doing a, a case where I had to then deliver my report and I had this very arrogant advocate who was asking me all those oh. questions. And I think my boss was cringing at that point, thinking I'm going to lose my call or whatever the case may be. But I was able to coherently give the information because it's stuff that I had researched and I was able to then reiterate the findings of my research. And I think then, you know, there was that realization that this works for me. So two years in the firm um, after fully realizing that this did not work for me and of course the second year of my placement at the firm I was able to take on additional work so I'd taken up the work at UJ. Um, I then tended in my resignation because I'd realized that I want to be an academic. I did not have a permanent post available for me at UJ but I decided mm. they will renew somehow something will materialize for me so I remember even when I put in my resignation, my boss calling me at that time, his name was Michael, to say, you know what, it's fine, I understand. I think this is for the best. It was so amicable where he he could also see that, you know what, you're okay here, but you might actually be happier and more mm. useful um, in an academic space, you know, mm -hmm. so... So after agreeing to that, I mean, I'm, I value every single experience that I got there. Uh, the firm was doing very well. They had very big clients. Um, it's looking very lucrative. So if one was looking at it from career choice, do I want to uh, be associated with prestige? It would have been wise to stay in the firm. But I think mm. it was, you know what, let me go to the classroom, to the students who nobody knows their name because I enjoy <laughs> that more. Mm. So that's then how I got into academia full-time. I worked as a postgraduate research consultant at the Writing Center at the University of Johannesburg as well. Yeah. Um, but I think mainly what I lectured was tax law, um, which you know made sense. It was pretty much aligned to my field of specialty. So after that, uh, then I taught for two more semesters at UJ. Mm -hmm. um, I think the reason why I had to move from that specific institution was that then, you know, we were looking to start a family. I needed a certain degree of permanence um, as well as commitment, which I wasn't getting because then you know how it is when you're getting a, a, a contract per semester, it becomes yeah. a bit worrisome. So um, I then applied for a position for lecturing at Monash. 
I was successful with that. That was in June of 2019. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, I was already expecting my daughter. So came in quite preggy. <laughs> Um, and then during the same time, uh, unbeknown to me, uh, the institution had just been purchased by uh, Advertech, which holds um, the Independent Institute of uh, Education. Moved here, lectured mostly the tax modules. There were, you know, those ones are always the difficult ones. Um, also did some part-time work with Busty College uh, Waterfall Campus mm -hmm. uh, for tax as well pretty much enjoyed that and then fast forward to 2022 our program manager resigned i had to act i was asked to act for the position acted for the position and i think it went quite well um despite the teething problems of you know that transition from uh, uh monash to iie um but things were going quite well so then I was then offered the position uh, of permanent program manager for the School of Law. So I signed my contract to start June the 1st, 2022. Uh, very happy that I did it. Very happy that I'm in academia. I'm in a space that I love. I don't drag my feet to come to work <laughs> on it, which wow. is very important. And oh, I used to struggle to get parking at ports every time. Like there's never parking. Mm. I don't know. You're in Cape Town, so... Joburg is completely different. If you mm. are coming to the high court, you're going to the magistrate's courts, um, especially in Joburg Central, ooh, you will struggle mm. with parking. You have to be friends with all the parking marshals so that your car is safe, but also so that they put a cone to put to so I don't have to worry about parking. Um, but I think, you know, just redirecting back to your main question to say, I've given just the steps that got me to where I am in a mm -hmm. nutshell. Um, I think one thing that I would say more importantly was that, you know, I was coming from a space whereby my family had been seriously prejudiced by economical challenges, political challenges that mm. put us in a position whereby, you know, there was a loss of a lot of things, finances, etc. Mm. So just with the struggle that came with that one could have foreseen a very difficult life, yeah. you know. Um, but you know, and I, I think I can say this quite unequivocally that education, uh, an opportunity to an education, then gave me a platform to not have to then struggle. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I always say to my students, I feel like once you, you know, could be successfully conclude your studies it does open up opportunities for a person even if you don't take the route of what you've studied um, even if you don't take the conventional route I do think that an education helps to formulate yourself as a person mm. helps to uh, open you up to options opportunity but also just critical thinking as a person better planning as a person maturity um mm -hmm certain life skills you get just from studying as well the challenges that you have with your supervisor um I had a student that I was supervising who didn't quite like me because of the feedback I gave her oh. uh, but after she was done and she graduated she says you know what thank you so much uh, mm. this really shaped me and really uh, sharpened my EQ so mm. she's very happy for the academic contribution but she thinks it sharpened her EQ um, I don't like students who don't communicate, but it's because mm -hmm. I learned that from my supervisor that if you're not communicating, if you're running late with the deadline, you don't go quiet and ask, wait for me to ask you. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like last minute things. I don't like procrastination, you know, those kinds of things. And it's because it's things that I learned as well and skills that were life skills that were cultivated in me during the course of my studies. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so that's how I am where I am at. I still have a passion to a certain extent of the corporate space mm -hmm. so I am a certified uh, commercial forensic practitioner um, and I quite enjoy that uh, 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 role and the way that it challenges me I find it a bit difficult sometimes if you present it with certain cases that need opinions yeah. um, but I've kept that going and I am also a member with the South African Institute of Taxation um, 
all bodies that I think, you know, help not just to get the points that you need to get, um, you know, per year, <laughs> <laughs> you know, your CPD points. Mm. It's not just about the CPD points. It's about um, continues to sharpen your mind, keeps you informed with tags you have to stay informed because it's forever changing. Mm. Um, but very happy to be in the space that I am in and, you know, solidly say, I think I am making a difference. I'm probably more valuable in this space than in the corporate space. Thank you so much for that wholesome introduction. Really amazing. And congratulations on, you know, the journey and where you are now. And I know a whole brother that your family is also proud of you. You've really done well for yourself as well as for them, you know you really did highlight how this journey is not just all about you and the academic accolades you score. The support is very relevant. And I like that, you know, in as much as academia is daunting, you have your feet in the practical world, nourishing yourself, but also indirectly, I think, nourishing your students with just more than, yes. you know, academic um, preparation. Like you said, with tax, you have to stay relevant. So that is very important. And I wish I were your student. They don't know what they're getting. I hope they know now. Awesome. I hope so too. <laughs> yeah. So, Thank you, Prim. Yeah, I'm going to skip my second question because the second question was, what courses have you taught and what value do they add to the students in terms of professional training? But I stand to be corrected. Is there anything you think you want to add to what you've said already? I would just say I, I, I really enjoy teaching tax specifically i've taught other modules like business mm -hmm. law you know uh, uh, uh administrative law but i think the focus on mercantile law i find needs more emphasis it's not a very comfortable space for the law students mm. but i you know the ironic thing is that as much as tax is not compulsory on every qualification i think it should <laughs> yes, <laughs> because it applies to all of us mm. it applies to all of us and i had people panicking um, I think about a month ago, uh, when SARS sent all the registered companies, um, the SMS, the, <laughs> the very frightful SMS that talked about, you know, everyone who had filed their uh, 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 returns were informed that they could, uh, you know, end up uh, liable criminally. Mm. So I had a lot of former mm. clients, um, even students, we've got a few students who run their own companies reaching mm. out to say, I've just been told... I might, you know, get a criminal record. How does this work? And I thought, you know what? People, everyone needs to get a bit of tax literacy. So mm -hmm. I'm a very huge advocate for, you know, that literacy. I don't find it very easy myself. I struggle with uh, that, which ironically is the one I did my <laughs> dissertation in. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's, 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 it's essential. Um, if I could, I would ask every faculty to offer it definitely sure. yeah yeah because we're all tax beings you know till yeah. yeah we keep paying tax for life um in different yeah. ways as well and because i think people sometimes simplify it to all oh, the tax that i pay when i buy stuff at the grocery store oh yeah apparently my salary is taxed and don't go deeper so even outside the business frame even in death you pay taxes so <laughs> how do you do that <laughs> Your estate so pay, pay out to your estate, oh, or if your estate is sold, it's you know, it, there's that thing, it's, it's such a corny statement by people who've done tax, whether in the accounting space or law space. Mm. But everyone always says, Abraham Lincoln said, you know, in life, there's two things that are guaranteed it's death and taxes, those two things you can't avoid. Mm, true, <laughs> so academia you know there's this high expectations I'm not so sure about you know in the faculty of law but people always ask the question to say as a lecturer what else are you doing to make time for research so beyond what you do you know how do you make time for research so I think that's a very very good question and I think it's it's something that I've been thinking about for the past one and a half years since mm -hmm. getting into my new role because I had to somewhat I wouldn't call it take a break, but I mm. had to find my feet in my new role. So for the past mm. one and a half years, haven't really had time, but, you know, I'm so grateful for the institution that I'm in because, you know, we've got a postgraduate research unit that has now then, you know, put more priority to research and research output. They 
um, have given us um, a day of research in a week. Wow. Not to say that you cannot research any other day, but you get a specific day where you can be. Um, so specifically, I get that day in my role uh, to say I am allowed to not be contactable so that I can make the mm. progress that I need to. Um, has it been easy? Maybe not so much because remember, we are offering two new qualifications. So oh. teething uh, challenges, trying to make sure that it goes as smoothly as possible. Um, but I think, you know, just looking at the past few years, not just, you know, this one and a half years, I think some of the main things is with making time for research. First of all, I think the best way to make time for research, I know this is not the question, uh, but I'm just going to add that to say, if you research on something that you love or that you enjoy, mm -hmm. you're looking forward to doing it. So it doesn't feel like a cumbersome task mm -hmm. because you enjoy it. So um, just as a tactic, I found that that has helped because in the past, like I said, I think I mentioned that before and how I'm yeah. not very good with that. And then I decided to write a whole paper on that. Sure. I struggled. Mm -hmm. So my strategy then post my LLM was always to say, look at writing on something that you enjoy. Um, because if you enjoy it, then you look forward, you'll make time for it. Um, on a day that you could be watching Netflix, you're happy to be reading up on something that you enjoy mm. so um i'm actually currently uh, busy with two projects that i'm hoping to complete at least in the first uh, uh third not third first quarter of 2024 mm -hmm. um and you know just to give context to what one enjoys i am looking at something to do with clickbait don't want to give too much away until <laughs> of course you know that I can actually, you know, aim it or target it at a list, you know, if possible. But, um, you know, I quite enjoy making use of the internet myself. I am a millennial, so quite enjoy that. But then I'm now looking at, you know, legal implications of sometimes people who make use of clickbait. Um, the YouTubers who put in a misleading oh. title, and then we all click to watch that video and they can monetize those views, but they've mm. misled the viewer. As yeah. much as we know that, you know, from a criminal law perspective or public law perspective, it's impermissible. Um, but what are the consequences from a civil or private law perspective? Mm. Um, and, you know, there's some countries now <laughs> um, in Eastern Europe mm. and in the uh, 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 Arabic nations that are making it illegal to filter pictures on dating websites, you know, things like that. And I'm just trying to explore that from a South African context, maybe yeah. even a regional context. Um, because I enjoy that stuff. I enjoy watching all the rubbish mm. and, you know, <laughs> being misled. Mm. So what, what does that mean, you know, legally? Um, and then also just because I'm in the teaching space, I have then expanded my research towards you know, education to see legal education, how can it be made more effective? So a colleague of mine and myself are collaborating on something along those lines. We actually did a case study with a group of students. Mm -hmm. uh, Netflix is involved. I will stop at that. Don't want to give too much away <laughs> so okay. that I can I can send you my link and then you send it to your platforms for everyone to read it. Yes. Otherwise not mm -hmm. read past everything. Um but yeah I, I think very difficult to find time. I took forever to answer that question. And that's a very uh, lawyer thing to do. But how do you find time? Prioritize what you enjoy. You need a bit of discipline. Mm. Um, I think not even a bit. You need a lot of discipline. Um, in my case, being a mother, it's not easy. So sometimes you have to sacrifice your late nights or early mornings for you to look mm. into that. Uh, but it, it goes without saying it's an imperative part of the academic space without the ability to do that you mm. can really if I'm not just fumble but maybe not also be able to make contributions and I mean who doesn't want to make contributions in the industry especially yeah. if you're calling yourself an academic mm. um so yeah discipline and finding something you enjoy Lovely. is how you make time <laughs> thank you so much for that and um because our listeners and viewers are taking down research notes i'll also take this opportunity to say something in relation to what you noted 
Um, I personally uh-huh. took on a PhD topic, which was quite heavy for me, but it was because uh-huh. the funding I needed for PhD was going to be from um, doing a research topic on conflict resolution in response to election conflicts, you know? And one mm-hmm. of my case studies was Zimbabwe, quite heavy for me because of having, yes. you know, first-hand experience. And my main interest has always been how gender and politics can work together. And obviously there was little room to explore that because the election conflicts I was looking at were mainly between like men, you know, like at that elite level. So I struggled yes. a lot. And after my PhD, people were like, where's the book you're going to create out of your dissertation? Where are the articles? And I told them straight up, that was the last you will see of me writing on election conflicts and whatnot, because mm-hmm. I was exhausted. But this yeah. year, I was like, I'm going to write on gender, whether gender and religion, gender and politics, and everything. Yes, I think I saw going. you did a conference yeah. around that. Because yeah. I remember seeing a conference around that. Yeah. So ever since I took that step, like my research life has been healthier. And even though I still experience like your writer's block and whatnot, it's a bit easier. I can think about it over a cup of coffee or even like in my sleep because yeah. it does comes naturally. And as a result, I feel like I'm in a better place as a researcher. So definitely I agree with you. And I'm glad that you're also looking at topics that people are interested in, but may not know that you can actually do research on that. Like for me, I get frustrated with, you know, YouTube clickbait and I don't want to ever yeah. create clickbait for viewers, you know, whether through a title or a picture. <laughs> and hopefully, you know, you said it's impermissible, but I don't know if we can completely police what's going on on the internet. There's so many platforms now. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Please, when the publications are out, let us know. I'll share it. We'll review it. And Absolutely. definitely value that Absolutely. addition to knowledge. Awesome. Thank you so much, Prim. So wish me the best for the month of January and February because I need to mm. finalize it by then. <laughs> you will, definitely. Yeah. So you're not only a professional, right? You've made reference to you being a mom. I know that you're also a wife and you do a lot of like extracurricular activities. Um, So if you don't mind sharing, you know, to whatever limitation you have given us, how do you stay grounded and involved in all facets of your life? So it's really not an easy one, you know, and I think it's one of those where I'm learning as I go. Mm -hmm. I definitely don't have it figured out. Yeah. Um, so I make the necessary changes when and as they, you know, uh, shoot up. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think one of the main things that I quickly learned, and I'm very fortunate that, you know, I had my child very prematurely. Mm-hmm. So she was in hospital for a while. But soon after she came out of hospital, COVID hit. So that was scary for us with a vulnerable child. But it really helped, I think, both myself and my husband to bond with her and really get to know her. Um, we got to a point whereby, you know, we also felt it was not right to, I think from the day the, the lockdown was announced to say it starts, but then I think we're given a 24 or 48 hour notice. We mm. actually said to um, our helper, because we never had a live-in helper. So we actually said to our nanny, we actually said to her, well, you know, with this, it's it's either we'll be asking you to move in, which keeps you from your family, which is not fair, mm. or you stay with your family. So rather you stay with your family and then, you know, we can try and meet you halfway somehow with the expenses. You don't have to worry about that. And mm. I think it really helped that isolation from the world helped us to bond with her, get mm-hmm. to know her as tiny and as young as she was at that point in time. Um, and I absolutely value that I know people you know don't have the best experiences with COVID and Mm. I even lost some family myself but if I can take away one positive thing from that is that I got time with my child so I think after that and having gotten to know her I actually even had to get out of my shell of laziness I was very lazy you know prior to having children you don't realize how taxing it is mentally emotionally all of that so I had Mm. to then start getting 
you know, a bit more active, uh, a bit more mindful, a bit more nurturing. Uh, and also the chores increase because somebody else is relying on me for everything. So, mm. you know, with, with all of that and COVID, I then quickly learned that I need to feed my mental health and wellness more than anything else. Mm. So as I'm still figuring it out, because I can't, I can't even give you things to say, oh, no, this is how I create a balance or how it mm-hmm. works because I'm figuring it out as I go. But what I've noticed is that what makes me the most adaptable, the most flexible and the happiest, and I think what makes my child happy as well is if I feed into my mental health and wellness, uh, which is why then the running that you mentioned, you said, do you think I'm a runner? <laughs> I think I'm a runner too, but I think by other people's definition, I am a very, very slow runner. <laughs> a runner is a runner Yo, I argue with people on that because get pace out of this there's people who can run but they don't <laughs> yeah so look my pace Um, you go to my Strava my running app you will think wow did you walk for most of it or whatever but I absolutely enjoy that I feel like it's and she's starting to, to enjoy it as well. So we, we actually do it as a family, myself, my husband, my daughter. Mm. And I think that has been very beneficial. So, yeah, so I think I figure it out as I go. But mm-hmm. the main thing that I would say is just to try and cope for any person, your mental health meant, matters the most. And you, one needs to feed that. One needs to feed that and very jealously guarded thank you so much for that and i i like your emphasis on feeding your mental health and being intentional about it and finding activities that help you you know to stay active and also to stay just out of like your work right and i i love that you've been able to have time you know with your family i understand that it can be very difficult I grew up with a mom who was a nurse and I think for the longest time I had the trauma of thinking she was never there because she was either at work during the day and some days she had night shifts. When it was not night shifts, she was sleeping because she had a night shift. So yeah, but I mean, my dad was there more, most of the time, um, but I do understand that some vocations can make it difficult. So I'm glad that academia, though it's difficult for women, um, you found your ways to navigate around it, even though it doesn't look like there's no perfect um, picture. So we get to the part of the conversations, which I kind of like cringe at, where I ask um, interview participants to ask me any questions, if they've got any. The mic is yours. All right. Um, so I actually thought about this a bit. And, you know, I would want to ask you, why why academia for you Mm -hmm. I think it's you are making some substantial contributions um I can't even put it in words and I personally follow your journey and I absolutely love it I love even your channel that talks about you know a few tips here and there I had to take an intermission with my doctorate studies. And, yeah. you know, I remember watching one of your videos. I'm like, no, I need to do it. I need to do it. I need to get back into it. Um, you know, my child is born now. Can't keep making excuses. So I have to get back into mm. it. But why academia? And do you feel that you have a sense of fulfillment with that as well? So why that? And are you fulfilled? Um as well as what are your future plans? Very excited to know what's coming next from you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for that. I hope I don't give you like a 10 minute response. So No, please. <laughs> okay. So why academia? For me, when I entered into university, I always say I knew that I wanted to get a PhD eventually, even though I didn't know what it was going to be in. But I had a passion for international relations. So I studied, you know, politics, international relations, and also being very passionate about gender justice. I ended up also taking up gender as a major. Um, Fast forward, I managed to earn my honors, master's and PhD. Um, And while I was doing my PhD, at the beginning of it, I was actually working. So 2017, after my master's, I got a job to work as a foreign affairs officer in Zimbabwe. So I was working for the government's uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. They asked which department I wanted to be in at my last interview. I was like, policy research. So I was like, 
I said research? Well, I guess it makes sense because I want to do research, right? I could have done other things because they've got political desks for different um, continents. And they've also got what they call a protocol section where you, I don't want to minimize their job, but like you're moving around with dignitaries, sorting out people's passports and all of that. And they also have a legal division. So I was like, no, policy research. Because in that section, we had to write the minister's weekly brief as well as monthly briefs mm-hmm. to diplomatic missions so I was leaving like my dream because I yes. think when you're in politics or international relations the closer you are to government actors it helps if you're writing the parliamentary talking points for the minister I mean if you're writing the brief that the president will present at the UN or the African Union but then I realized <laughs> there was something that was missing um, I didn't realize that I loved my work so much. Not that I'm a narcissist, but I was like, I'll never be credited for this. No one will ever know that I wrote this or that I contributed to that. Can't the minister just say, uh, I would like to acknowledge my word? <laughs> I can't even do that because there's also a long line where I write, I submit to my deputy director, it goes to the director, then the you know, the permanent secretary, then the minister, then the presidency. So there's always people adding and editing anyway. So I'd probably be an et al. <laughs> at the end. Oh, no. But et al. is better. Et al. is better. The next thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so after 18 months, which is, I probably contributed to more than like 60 briefs. Yeah. Amazing. In that time. I told myself I wanted to do research in academia because I wanted to own my work more. And also there are constraints when you're working in foreign affairs because you stand for your country's foreign policy. And usually your country's foreign policy is your president's foreign policy, regardless of the country you're in, Russia, the US, whatever the case may be. So my contributions, I think, were limited in that sense. Um, I saw myself also handing in a resignation. My HR manager was just like, girl, I'm not going to accept this resignation. And then it took them three months. They were like, in three months time, if you still feel like leaving, come forward, we'll let you go. The three month mark hit. I went, I was like, I'm ready to leave. And I actually had a very teary exit interview. I've never said this on my channel. So there we go. Because (laughs) I was sure But then there were so many people who told me that like nine out of 10 people who exit diplomacy regret it. And seeing Mm. myself in that, I was like, no, but I can be the one team. I can be part of those people. So I left, came to the University of Cape Town, also took up jobs as teaching assistant. I had to juggle like two of them to make ends meet, you know, because the one could only pay rent and the other one could help me with food amongst other things so literally that's what I had to do sacrifices for my passion um I also had relatives helping me with my accommodation my parents obviously chipped in um quite a lot so when I was doing my PhD I told myself I want to become a lecturer which was quite difficult because at UCT it was difficult to have even had had like black women teaching me I never even had a black woman lecturer in politics. So I also never had one uh, for really? my law degree. That's interesting. Not so a single the dream one. was wild. I'm like, who am I? But yeah. I think the guts really helped. I started lecturing by mistake. My supervisor <sighs> hired a guest lecturer, an expert in peace and security, to come and speak about um, the African Union and the International Criminal Court. And the guest lecturer was like, they can't make it. So I was like to my supervisor, don't stress, I can lecture. And he was like, we're talking about 300 students here. Do you know your stuff? I was like, let me do the slides and come talk to you about it. And then I went, pitched the lecture, went, taught the lectures um, for that topic. Students were impressed, gave my supervisor feedback. And literally that's how I started. And it was unpaid. COVID was a blessing to me as well in many ways because we had to do online learning. So all these lecturers were like, we don't know how to teach online. 
And I was like, well, I've been speaking online since 2019 on YouTube. It's quite formal. And I've tutored and, and lectured before. And lo and behold, I was given a full course, third year undergraduates to teach um, on global governance. And obviously that was, I think, a stamp of approval for me. And I got into this. However, it's not easy. I have taught about four courses now. Um, so global governance, I've taught gender and the politics of development. I've taught a course on transnational feminisms and I'm teaching a course on gender um, in Africa. But the challenge for mm -hmm. me is that unlike you, I'm not in like a full-time or tenure position. So it gets really, sometimes you get bitter, you know, because I yeah. apply for opportunities and sometimes the missing link is they probably want someone who had like already has a work permit or like a permanent residence permit in South Africa. So for me now, I realize that if people can take me as a guest or as um, what we call an ad hoc lecturer, I would do that to serve my interest um, in, in teaching. Funny enough, yes. it has been easy to get visas for research jobs. So yes. right now, my main work is as a researcher. I'm at the Stellenbosch University and lecturing is more like a part-time gig. But having a lecturing position helps me because it keeps me nourished. I enjoy disseminating <laughs> information. I enjoy discussing with students because I also learn quite a lot from them. So whether it's fulfilling or not, I think I, te I tend to the side that loves lecturing. And also having a research job is a privilege because not everyone who's got a master's or PhD manages to get, you know, research work. So being grateful for those two, I'm really happy. Although I would want to be a full tenure track lecturer who does research. I'm on the other end. I'm like a full-time researcher who happens to lecture. Um, yeah. So that's my response to your question. Also, what keeps me grounded is doing things that I love. Um, I love running and I love going outdoors as a hiker. Those things, I imagined myself doing them when I was a kid, when I used to watch National Geographic. Like, I want to see nature. Oh, wow. Who, who, who imagines themselves hiking as a kid? Oh, my goodness. And I was like, I want that big bag. I want those hats. That is such a nerdy thing to say. But, <laughs> you are a nerd. Yes. So <laughs> now when I do those things, literally the version of me that was 10 years old is happy and yes. yeah I'm sure my life I can do more like international travel amongst other things but for now I've fulfilled many things that I, I would have wanted there are stresses that come with this thing rejections from papers you can teach Oof. them who look and tell me about it for doing the degree just because they need it so although fulfillment can look like wanting to see everyone happy or wanting to get positive results in any thing, it doesn't always happen. Yeah. 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 Mm. You know, I, I actually, thank you so much for that answer. I think that, that that really gives me even more context to what I know thus far about your academic journey. Mm. But, you know, I actually just wanted to comment on the frustrations that come ups from time to time mm -hmm. even if one is looking at you know there's 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 joys or comfort that come with a certain alignment towards your aspirations but that being said I think I'd want to just somewhat encourage you um mm -hmm. I don't think that you need it but I um, need it just, trust me just to, just to encourage you as a fellow you know black uh female uh, somewhat young. Mm -hmm. Let's call ourselves young. We are. For all the kids and purposes, we are <laughs> uh, a, 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 a person in the academic space. You mentioned something very interesting that you know when you took up your studies, your faculty was not very transformed. Mm -hmm. There was no relatability with regards to who was delivering education to you. And I was in the very same space. Um, mm. Law is very much a boys' club, um, and a you know none black boys club even more but even the mm. you know the, the african males are they get more uh, uh opportunities and you know, I know oh. it's, it's controversial to say but i think the statistics speak for themselves yes. um 
So it's, 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 as much as it's very difficult, I think that transformation or that depiction of female black can also do it, does know a lot, can also mm. deliver the education. It's very important because you might not realize it, but then there's so many other female black persons who are also looking at you and thinking, well, I you know, can't wait to also be able to do that. Um, and that's mm. because you're there standing in front of them or you're delivering research or you are publishing a paper and mm. then they see what, wait, what, um, you know, so we can do this. Uh, it's, it's very ironic how there is a struggle, but it's still there. It's, it's, it's an international thing. Now, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going into a whole gender uh, a discussion necessarily, but then just pointing out the obvious um, females make the majority of the population in the world as a whole, mm. not just in Southern Africa. But as far as opportunities come, sometimes there may be limitations to that, or sometimes when one gets the opportunity, there is an expectation of, oh, you know, if you're female, then what's going to happen? You get married and then you stop working or you have kids and you're going to have excuses or whatever the case may be. So mm. very important to continue strong in your journey because you have no idea how many people you're inspiring, myself included. Um, I think you were in, where were you? Either Switzerland or Germany recently? Was Germany, yeah. And I saw that and I said, my child needs to grow up. I'm ready to travel <laughs> and talk to people. Um, yeah. They need to see all this melanin talking about yeah. complicated things, you know. So it's small things, but there are people who are watching, people who are taking notes, people who are getting inspired and possibly even pushed to do better for themselves. Um, so thank you for, for, for those contributions. And I think you must stay firm in them, even if it's not, you know, most of us are never really in the spot that we want to uh, mm. be in. But while you're in that spot, you know, just being in the, living in the present, you need to understand that you are doing beyond amazing. And I really, really respect you as an academic and look up to you as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Wow. I don't know how to react to that. I'm, I'm getting a bit emotional. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll take it in as I ask you the last question. Do you have any last words for our viewers or listeners? So because it's research notes, I'm not too sure then who your audience mainly consists of. So I'll give two messages. Mm -hmm. So to the aspiring academic or current academic, uh, whether very seasoned, nervous, whatever the case may be, I think it's very important to, you know, be reminded to show kindness. And I'm saying that because, you know, we're during the exam season here and I've seen that a lot of our students are, and you know, most of our students make up the Generation Z uh, yes, demographic. Probably. Yes. And there's a lot of difficulty that students face within their studies. Um, when I studied, I had you know some professors who you walk to their door they won't even look up at you and they'll say what mm. do you want I'll tell you my consultation times this time and if you come in five minutes before the end of the consultation time you can't have the consultation no things like that mm. and you know it's just a very tough time but I think for this generation we all owe it to them to be kinder mm -hmm. um so that you can cultivate the competencies that you need to cultivate whatever qualification you're teaching in, so that you can yeah. cultivate some confidence, so that you can cultivate some dialogue and um, enjoyment of studies. I very much advocate for empathy, but I also very much advocate for fun in education, mm -hmm. find ways, creative ways, you know, the digital space is coming in um, to academics who are supervising students. <laughs> Watch out for AI tools. Yeah. I am seeing messes with people who have 100% generated papers oh, so that's a bit worrying side note but you know overall just show kindness be creative make learning fun for your mm. students and do what you love make all the quirky research uh the things that make people cringe do it if you enjoy it <laughs> you know you're going to contribute and somebody's yeah. going to cite you for it and you know the break boundaries um then for the students who are watching this who possibly want to be in the academic space mm -hmm. i would say that you know 
keep pushing. Uh, it's going to be ups, it's going to be downs. Uh, some of us really struggled with our first research <laughs> project mm. where we wanted to cry, where we wanted to say, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm. I choose, you know, a housewife or I choose to be a <laughs> something else, uh, mm. professional, corporate, you know, but won't be an easy journey, but it can be done. And, you know, just work towards it, um, stay focused, it's okay to fall off the wagon. You get back on mm-hmm. it. It's not a consistent journey because it does have its ups and downs. But all the best and keep pushing. You know, you can achieve anything. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's pretty much what I have. Thank you so much. I'm not saying Lexus, Nexus, and Utah. Or, no, I don't have time for that. I just had to. <laughs> <laughs> nice, lovely. Those are very I'll valuable. I'll, yes. I'll, I'll share that on another day but yeah oh and to the students don't use chat gpt and no, all those listen. To it's 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 actually you know I, I don't know about the policies of some institutions but mm-hmm. with us we classify it as cheating um, because okay. if you're going to have something else a tool uh, you know give a presentation and make it seem as if it's your own then that's a problem yeah i do know our faculty specifically is looking at finding ways to reference ai and to guide students on how to use it correctly because we also Mm. can't get away from it Mm. um but if you don't know how to use it correctly if you haven't been given guidelines on how to use it correctly just don't do it yeah it's not worth it um in some professions if you're in accounting if you're in law if you are in uh, engineering where there's a higher moral and ethical standard uh, Mm -hmm. because of the nature of the job you don't want to be flagged for that it can have very detrimental consequences to one's career thank you so much for that and i think people need to set and abide to ethical standards you know and hold themselves up to a high standard i always used to say to students who engage in like high plagiarism intentionally you know this is a form of self-sabotage so yeah you know you need to still be happy about engaging with readings or material putting yourself in it what ai does for me is mostly maybe to simplify and in many ways Mm -hmm. i still have to check back you know because you have to know what historically has been researched why the topics and trends you're doing research on are where they are today so Mm -hmm. hopefully i don't know how many people are going to take this message but you need to be very serious about how you engage with artificial intelligence software, particularly, you know, your chat GPTs and mm-hmm. universities, governments, obviously they're slow to keep up because they're not the ones developing this AI or feeding information into it. So yes. I think as a person who wants to be a professional and take pride in their work, then it's your duty to filter it. I think personally, because I lived in a time where I didn't have internet, and then I had internet, and now there's AI. I am able to step into different shoes where I do the traditional reading. I look at um, what has been done in terms of research and go to it. So I think I've had the advantage of being in different seasons, and I'm quite capable of, you know, doing the traditional reading, looking up articles, reading through them, making notes, and then checking what AI has to offer and, and comparing with it. I haven't used it to write personally. Um, I've used it to search to what extent it can compromise my students' work. Fortunately for me, because I look at gender issues from an African perspective, really it it gives out junk. So if a student were to use it, they're literally shooting themselves in their foot. I use a lot of Africa-based authors also for most topics. And those are unlikely to have their work on AI having been like summarized and stuff. Yeah. So hopefully it also gets to a stage where we fed it with information that is globally uh, representative in terms of geography, gender, and, yes. um, and other yes. things. Okay. Well, just to, to just to give you a peace of mind, it does that with tax as well, because I had a student who submitted a paper to me who clearly had not proofread sure. <laughs> the work. And um, it talked about the Senate and the essay it talked about the senate yes and it also talked about the irs not the sars (laughs) yeah fun thing Mm. fun things 
very fun things. <laughs> That's frustrating. You know, after all that yeah. teaching and assignment of like relevant work. Right, right. So, and then they're telling me about the IRS. And I'm like, you learned nothing from my class. Wow. Well, mm. thank you very much for showing me that you care <laughs> and listen in class. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so yeah. much melissa um for joining us today hopefully i'll invite you to another episode probably not research notes because i'm you know experimenting with different types of series um to our yes. viewers and listeners thank you once again this is research notes podcast series i'm dr primrose as a j lima on a mission to demystify the world of research by engaging in conversations with a diverse set of intellectuals academics, industry professionals, and creators. It's goodbye for now.